Hello and welcome to the third episode for the Bronte Network. And as the theme this week will be animals, as you can see, I've brought my own dog, Byron, along. In this episode, I want to talk about the Bronte's animals, both real and fictitious. And a good place to start is with Emily Bronte. Her dog, Keeper, was a large Mastiff mix, and it had a nasty habit of jumping on Emily's bed. And Emily reportedly told the housekeeper that if her dog were to do this one more time, then she would ensure that he never did it again. Sure enough, she went out, came back, and found that Keeper was once again lying on the bed. She went upstairs and in a fit of rage dragged him down by the collar and beat him until his eyes all swelled up. After this, however, she nursed Keeper back to health and apparently the dog never left her side until the day she died. Keeper and Emily found a literary form in the characters of Shirley and her dog Tata in Charlotte Bronte's novel Shirley. Tata, like Keeper was a large Mastiff dog and also like Keeper was extremely protective of his mistress. Another of Emily's perhaps more surprising pets was a goshawk that she adopted called Nero and this lived with them until Emily and Charlotte went to Brussels. We get a strong sense of just how important the Bronte's animals were to them through their diary papers in which they regularly report the goings on of the animal community just as much as the human. In June of 1843, Anne Bronte was given her own dog from her wards at Thorpe Green. Flossie was a spaniel and did this dog form the basis of Sancho in the Tenant of Wildfell Hall? Well, I think it's entirely possible. Another thing to note about the Brontes dogs was their aunt's reticence towards them. She would have only allow them in the parlour at certain times of the day. However, Keeper and Flossie were such integral parts to the family that they managed to eventually win over even Aunt Bramwell. Another biographical detail to note about Emily was that she, like Shirley in Charlotte Bronte's book was bitten by a dog and she returned home and again like Shirley cauterised the wound herself using a hot iron from the fire. Again a clear indication of both these characters, both real and fictional, and their incredible mental strength and willpower. Another interesting event that occurred in Emily's life was a dog fight in Haworth and whilst the men were watching on, laughing and unsure what to do, Emily ran into the parsonage kitchen and returned with a pot of pepper, which she spread liberally over the dogs and, of course, broke up the fight. But it wasn't just Emily who had some interesting run-ins with animals. Whilst Anne was in Scarborough, actually dying there, she was horrified by the way that the donkeys were being treated on the beach. So even days from her death, she ran down and told off the donkey master for his stern treatment. In Anne Bronte's Agnes Grey, animals serve as an important indicator of the character's moral standing. For instance, when Agnes leaves home for the first time, she kisses the cat goodbye. In contrast, Mr Hatfield, the hellfire and brimstone preacher, when he visits the poor cottager Nancy, he kicks her cat across the floor, symbolic of his vicious attitudes. However, when Mr Weston, who symbolises a more liberal strain of Protestantism, visits Nancy, we're told that he makes a fuss of her cat. In a similar way, when Agnes is looking after the Bloomfield children, they tell her with glee how they enjoy torturing the innocent birds. And in response, Agnes puts the poor creatures out of their misery by dropping a heavy stone upon their nest, an act she finds incredibly difficult to do, but one she feels compelled to enact, to end their suffering. 
When she moves and resides with the Murrays, she enjoys the company of the dog Snap. However, this dog is sent to be looked after by the dog catcher, a character who is known for his vicious treatment of the animals. Therefore, when Mr. Weston arrives to propose marriage to Agnes at the end of the novel, with Snap following after him, who he has rescued from the clutches of the evil dog snatcher, then this serves as a clear indication of his moral integrity, something Agnes picks up on. In a similar way, by looking at Charlotte Bronte's Shirley and how Tata treats the visitors to Shirley's house, we begin to get a sense of their moral standing, ranging from love and affection towards the dog, which is less returned, to fear and trepidation, which is an insight into the character's weak mental state. And of course, who can forget Wuthering Heights, where Heathcliff hangs the poor puppies from the railings, again showing a lack of moral compunction. And of course, not to forget Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and Rochester's dog Pilot, who is described as a great dog whose black and white colour made him a distinct object against the trees, a lion-like creature with long hair and a huge head. So from this rather romanticised description of Pilot, we're given an insight into the character and nature of Rochester. This is a formidable man who stands out against the landscape. Thank you very much for watching this short video, and I hope it's given you an insight into the world of the Bronte's animals, both real and fictional. I would really recommend going back to the novels and having a look what animals there are, and what this actually reveals about the characters. Thank you.